We begin today with the week of confusion at customs for Bahamians desperately looking to leave for help and aid in the days after Dorian's destruction. Many faced a confusing new crisis when the relatively simple travel process to the United States suddenly became more complicated. Some boarding ferries or flights were turned away, asked for lists of paperwork they hadn't ever needed before. U.S. Customs and Border Protection initially assured storm refugees help and access, though many experienced what they described as a crackdown as the week went on. So, where do things stand today? Let's ask Diane Sabatino. She is Director of Field Operations for U.S. Customs and Border Protection in the Miami and Tampa field offices. She is the boss of Customs at Miami International Airport, Fort Lauderdale International, the airports in West Palm Beach, Key West Plus, Port Miami and Port Everglades, a very big job. Good morning, Diane, great to have you here. Good morning. So happy you were able to come in today. A lot of people have questions that you are going to answer. Um, let's start out with defining what the actual rules are, especially for people from the Bahamas who've been able to travel back and forth traditionally pretty easily. What, how is the rules as they stand right now? Nothing has changed with respect to the documentary requirements for individuals that are arriving uh, from the Bahamas. Uh, we've seen as of uh, this morning just over 4,000 people uh, arriving from the Bahamas. About 40% of those are uh, have been U.S. persons, U.S. citizens and LPRs. What and LPR? What's an LPR? A lawful permanent resident yeah. who has status here in the United States. Uh, about 60% of those individuals have been foreign nationals, the vast majority of which have been Bahamian nationals that have been able to arrive without incident. All right, well, last weekend, last Saturday, the grand celebration, the cruise ship that had gone to uh, the Bahamas to pick up refugees came back and a lot of those people had gotten on that ship and your agency had shown really great compassion, discretion, and almost anybody who wanted to get on that ship had gotten on even if they did not have a visa or a passport. And so what changed between then and later in the week? Nothing changed with respect to that arrival. And I, I do want to highlight that everyone uh, in that scenario was exceptionally well intended. Uh, our responsibility is to make sure that we have clarity and information. And what we cannot do is operate uh, with a broad brush or in absolutes uh, when people are seeking to arrive to the United States. And we need good information from the carriers. And again, well intended. We have had a number of successful arrivals uh, from that particular company since then with coordination. What happens sometimes in these moments is people make rash decisions or don't understand or they're shaken about what the expectations are. But our carriers are very well versed in understanding the requirements. The, the ferry uh, companies, the airlines, anybody who's traveling back and forth, the companies, are they really principally responsible for making sure their customers meet the requirements of customs and border protection? The carriers are ultimately responsible for who's boarding their, their vessels or, or air conveyances in a, in, a, I'm sorry, in a safe and secure manner. Okay, so what happened to really stir the pot was after this cruise ship last Saturday arrived that Michael was referencing with some 1,400 aboard, everything seemed smooth, they were admitted into the country. The very next night on this ferry, 100 and some odd people were asked to get off still in Nassau. What was the difference between the cruise ship mm -hmm. arrival on Saturday and the ferry trip on Sunday? What, what were the differences as far as CBP goes, why one seemed very smooth and the other was chaos? In that particular instance, and with respect to the vessel that arrived uh, the prior Saturday, coordination and information in advance and understanding what the requirements are and us having the opportunity certainly to apply discretion for those who may be challenged in terms of the documents that they can present. So um, discretion is something that we really wanted to talk about because on the website CBP outlines the rules and regulations and then at the very bottom kind of in a small print it says that age, each agent has discretion but discretion is kind of a subjective thing. It, is there criteria are there criteria for what that discretion looks like in case-by-case -case basis? It is a case-by-case -case basis and as evidenced by uh, the uh, scenario that played out in 2010 where we had thousands of people coming from Haiti following the earthquake, our officers are very well versed in ensuring that individuals that are arriving are arriving safely 
and yeah. uh, properly documented and in those cases it's not going to be absolute as to the criteria of what they will need for us to apply discretion yeah. but that's where we get the clarity and the information when the individual is standing with us. Yeah, Ms. Sabatino here is a form from your office if you can see this at home I'm not sure anyway it is U.S. Customs Border Protection and people who are seeking to enter the United States have a number of documents which they are supposed to present including evidence of employment, pay stubs, proof of foreign residence, evidence of a bank account, uh, all kinds of utility bills. But you know, if you've been through a Cat 5 hurricane, you're not gonna have any of this stuff. So, I mean, is that where your agents have discretion? If somebody says, look, they were all blown away. I don't have any of that. That particular document I had not seen before. It is a tool that's given to individuals where there's some clarity or uh, lack of information or inconsistencies. That's used in our preclearance environment as a guideline to help people potentially come back if they have been uh, uh, not allowed to board the aircraft. But I, I do want to reiterate that a significant number of individuals that uh, have come through preclearance and uh, here to the ports of entry in the U.S. have not had challenges to arrive. And that was, this This list is in question because, to, to your own answer, we did a report this week on a mother and daughter who travel back and forth fairly frequently mm -hmm. and had never gotten this list of things that they needed to provide until they went to get on a plane paid for by a sponsor here who was bringing them over, they have housing, they have sponsorship, and for the first time, according to them, for the first time, they got this list of documents that they had never had to present before. It, understanding this is a, a case that you don't know about in particular. Mm -hmm. What might have happened here? Why would that be? I suspect that in our secondary review, when individuals present themselves, they'll go through a primary screening and a, an officer can make a determination as to whether or not they can uh, proceed forward. It is in our preclearance environment, not having full visibility on that case. That is actually a tool to help them potentially uh, clarify some inconsistencies. It's also not requirements. We're not requiring those documents. Those are guidelines as to things they can provide. If they don't have those, it's also not an all-inclusive list of items that they could provide. But it is a very small number, from what I understand, in that environment where uh, there were challenges or circumstances that we needed greater clarity on. Uh, Ms. Sabatino, you are a, a, pol a, a political person. You're not a, you know, in your job, you're jo in your job because you're competent. But you've been getting mixed messages out of Washington. On Monday, the acting director oh. of your agency stood before the media and said, basically, any Bahamian who is desperate and needs refuge in the United States, we're going to welcome them. And then, a short time later, the president appeared on the lawn and said, we're going to stop drug dealers and bad people from the Bahamas who want to get here. And that seemed to turn it around. So obviously, ultimately, you report to the president. Did that kind of filter down to you? I certainly saw uh, both of the uh, statements that were made to me uh, and understanding and working within the scope of what I do on the day-to-day. -day. There was no lack of clarity or mixed messaging there. I think in the context in which the questions were asked, uh, what the president's response is, we're not going to abandon the law. We can't. It would be dangerous to do that. We certainly, uh, our priority mission of, uh, you know, the securing the integrity of the border. Right. And at the same time, in the context in which our acting commissioner responded, our responsibility, we're not going to turn our backs. So we're going to apply discretion when appropriate and ensure that there's maximum flexibility given, yeah. I mean, Devastation seems like an understatement, you know, and our hearts are broken for the, the people of the Bahamas to include everyone that resided <laughs> over there, Bahamian nationals, U.S. citizens, and all the third country nationals. Right. And we are going to do our best to ensure that they arrive here in a safe manner and that they have an opportunity once they're here, you know, if uh, certainly they need some time to uh, reassess. They, they can't be expected to make decisions about a permanent uh, solution for themselves right. in a matter of days following this storm and what we have seen is a significant population of people coming here to get supplies and go back and go to the back. Bahamas. Yeah. Yeah. They're not looking to abandon the Bahamas. Right. Well, well, just they're Bahamians. They want to go back to their country when it's rebuilt but it's going to be a while before it is in the Northwest Highlands. Diane Sabatino, great to have you come on. Thank you for giving Appreciate us clarity. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you so much. <laughs>